All right, it's time to begin this morning. Good to see everybody in the house of the Lord on this wonderful cold, cold Sunday morning. And uh, But hey, it's warm in here. And uh, so we're just happy to see each and every one. Those that are watching live, thank you so much as well. And uh, just get in and let God bless you And uh, on this Sunday morning. Would you bow your heads and your hearts at this time? Father, again, we're always grateful to be in your house, to be with your people. We would ask today that you would meet each and every need of every person. God, you know everything that weighs upon all of our heart, God. And you know the situations that we deal with from day to day. And we know that, God, that you're bigger than anything that we face, any trouble and any trial. Lord, we're thankful that our blessings always outnumber our troubles. And I pray that your spirit would reach down and touch every person today. In Jesus' name, amen. Put, put your hands together. Worship him. Well, now Jesus is gone away to prepare for me a place. He has built for me a home beyond the sky. And I'll be ready for that day when my soul shall fly away to that mansion waiting over on the other side. Amen. this this morning. Heaven's gates are made of pearl. Ain't nothing like it in this world. Those foundations, they are made of precious stone. Well, and finally on that day, I'll see my Savior face to face. I'm gonna lift my head. Oh! 
it in this world amen our eyes will one day see what we have been going toward all these years and it's going to be glorious amen sing the wondrous love of Jesus sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed you prepare plus a place No, no. 
Worship him this morning. My, my. Thank you, Lord. I enjoy worshiping with you on this side, but I can't wait to worship with you on the other side. Amen. Ushers, would you come? We're going to receive our tithe and offering. It supports the ministry of this church and give as given unto the Lord. That's what you're doing, and God will bless you. He loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Bow your heads and your hearts again. Father, we worship you in giving today, recognizing who you are and who we are. And we know, God, that we'd have nothing if it wasn't for you. And I ask you to bless every home, every heart, every person today. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, aren't you glad to be blood-bought this morning? Amen. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for joy. Cry aloud and be free. We're going to glorify the name of our God. We're the blood-bought the church. Let's do that one more time. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for joy. Cry aloud and be Oh, the church of me. And now we are in that army of the Lord. We've been watching 
Worship him. Worship him. Hey, you know what? In the midst of a pandemic, this song should have been the theme song of the church. I don't know why we're shutting down. I don't know why they're quitting. I don't know why they're taking a seat. But we're a redeemed church, blood-bought church. Nothing can stop this mighty moving force. They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for joy. Cry aloud and be free. We're gonna glorify the name of our God with the blood of the church of the flee. They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for joy. Cry aloud and be free. We're gonna glorify the name of our God. One more time, they shall lift up, they shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for joy. Cry aloud and be free, we're going to glorify the name of our God, through the blood of the church of peace. Oh, and we are in the army of the Lord, we've been washed in His blood. Get beneath my feet. Every prisoner held captive must be free. For your deliverance has come through the power of the Son. With the blood from the church of the Oh, and we are in that army of the Lord. We've been washed in His blood. And we are going for it. There's nothing that can stop. For this mighty moving force with a shout of praise. Every song hold the bondage gonna get beneath my feet. Every prisoner of captain must be free. For your deliverance has come through the power of the sun. With the blood of the church of the They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for joy. Cry aloud in the we're gonna glorify the name of our God. One more time this morning. They shall lift up. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for joy. Cry out and be free. We're gonna glorify the name of our God. We're the church of the Oh, and we are in that army of the Lord. And we are going for There is nothing that can stop This mighty movie for us To the shout of praise A two-edged sword Every song hold a bondage Gotta get beneath my feet Every prisoner and captain must be free For your deliverance has come Through the power of the sun With the blood of the church of me Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, worship him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hey, we're in the presence of the Lord. We're in the presence of the Lord. You don't need to waste that time. You don't need to waste that time. About 2,000 years ago, a little over,
There was a man that found himself. He was sitting on the side of the road. When he figured out that he was in the presence of the Lord, he cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, will you have mercy upon me? Jesus, thou son of David, will you have mercy upon me? My God, and he cried. He didn't let nothing. He said, I want my sight back. Hey, if you need a miracle, you need something from the Lord, hey, you just need, when you're in the presence of the Lord, tell him what you need. Tell him what you need. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated at this time. Again, we thank you so much for being here. My, it's just uh, just always good to be in God's house. We want to say, especially, um, we want to make our announcements. February the 19th at 6.30, the ladies' dinner and devotion. Been asked to bring your favorite Italian dish, whatever that may be. And uh, so... Uh, Again, I'll go ahead and reiterate, that does not include garlic bread. So, bring your favorite Italian dish. All right. Also, uh, of course, you know the weather. Everybody's probably watched the weather, seen the weather. We got two big rounds supposed to be headed our way this week. And uh, due to that, we're going to dismiss tonight's service. Lord willing, we're planning on doing a panel so you can watch live. And uh, so, but keep... Keep that in mind, and um, if you know of somebody that's not on Facebook, if you could pick up a phone and call them, it would be helpful. Be grateful. We try to do what we can. The best thing that you can do is look on the Facebook page, and uh, you will see there and of who of, of the of announcements for services and things of that. Don't even know about Wednesdays. Too early to tell. Uh, but if it goes the way they're saying, we probably will not be here Wednesday. We're not for sure. Uh, so, but, but keep that in mind, and uh, we hope that everybody continues to stay safe uh, and stay warm. It's going to be cold, and uh, so we want to uh, just remind you of that. Also, um, let's see here. Of course, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, if we're not able to be here the rest of the week, we'll be here, Lord willing, uh, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, uh, ready to worship the Lord. All right, Sister Becky, would you come? I know some of you probably couldn't hear, but I was hearing wisecracks from up here in the stage when I, Brian asked me to come. But isn't it good to be in the God's house this morning? Amen. It's cold outside, and I hate cold weather. But I'm looking forward to one good snow. I guess we're going to get two, but uh, then I'll be ready for spring and summer. But uh, Lord's good to us, isn't he? Don't matter what we go through this morning, what we're facing, we win. Right. If you're in Christ, we win. And uh, I'm just thankful. But this morning I told Steve that since it was actually actually falling on Valentine's Day, I said I'd like to do something, a little, little surprise for our couples and stuff. You know, God honors marriage, and, um, and we're thankful and, and for all of his blessings. And, but the best relationship you can have, of course, is with Christ. But this morning it being Valentine's Day, um, as you come in, I was over there writing names down, uh, putting my little bag. But we appreciate all of you, all of our families here. We have a great... Great group here at Faith Worship Center. Amen. Yep. Brian, you want to draw? The way Michael Owens can't say I cheated. James and Nita Mashburn. Right. We appreciate them. How many years y'all been together? No. <laughs> 97 years, that's, that's a record. We appreciate James and Anita. Thank you all very much. Yes, yes. Amen. Amen. All right. That's a long time. That's a long time. So, anyway. Brother Jeff, would you come? Are you thankful he came looking for you this morning? One night while on life's raging sea, it 
looked as if I would suffer to be as the blackness of night could close off the light. My heart sank with fear. And my desperate cry, it rang out with pride. And all I could see was no hope inside. With faith all was gone, well, I met the one who came looking for me. He came looking for me. He came looking for me. He made a way when there was no way that I could see. When I drifted far, but Jesus was me. Picked out my grave to put me away. Now I drifted so far, but anyone care that I soon be lost. Well, I knew my destruction was a matter of time, but Jesus appeared, said this one is mine. From all home, she walked through the storm. He came looking for me. He came looking for me. He came looking for me. He made a way, but there was no way that I. That's you too. He came looking for me. Well, and he made a way, but there was no way that I could see. Well, when I ripped it far, my Jesus was a new, and he rescued my soul. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. All right, we want to dismiss our children in primary class to go to class and appreciate all of our children's church workers and everyone that does what they do to make it happen. Such a blessing they are. Amen. All right, would you stand again across the building? We believe that Jesus is still a healer. Do you believe that today? His blood, every blood, every, his blood paid for everything that you and I have need of. And we're thankful for what he did. And I pray that you will come faith believing and, and bring your need to the Lord today because God is still meeting the needs of his people. Would you, as they continue to worship, we want you to bring them to the Lord. Yes. Open the eyes yes. of my heart, Lord. Worship Center, would you come and help us today, please? I pray.
good anointing in here this morning. Amen. I appreciate the presence of the Lord. It's always good to be in God's presence. It's nothing like the presence of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, praise and worship team. Didn't they do a phenomenal job this morning leading us in praise and worship? Come on, let them know you appreciate them today. Amen. We're very thankful for them. Very thankful for their contribution to the service. We want to say thank you so much, everybody that's here today uh, to service with us. I know it's cold outside and we've got some weather coming, but God bless you so very much for, for coming to the house of the Lord. Uh, being in God's house is better than sitting at home this morning. Amen. And so, so we're glad that you're here today. I see most of you uh, caught my announcement on, uh, on Facebook this morning. Because I had all kinds of different smart aleck comments about not parking anything but a Ford. But and Brother Mike said, I was going to ask you to park mine because it's a Buick. And I said, well, I would have done that. He said, what's GM? I said, yeah, but it's like the Christian don't let his light shine. It's kind of hiding <laughs> under the Buick name. you know. So, but hey, we're, we're glad that you're here today. It's just good to be in the house of the Lord. I do want to announce also, Pastor Brian, I was going to announce, but I want to announce Again, in regards, last Sunday night, we took up our building fund offering. And then we started out with this remodel at the, just right after the first of the year or before the turn of the year of uh, $55,000 on our remodel. And uh, we've, our building fund offerings that we've taken, all of that applies. Uh, last month, we had an offering of $4,200. This month, we had another offering of $4,000. Praise the Lord for that. And so we're now from the 55 down to 38,000, and we're going to we're plan on reaching that total before the end of the year. And so we want you to get involved. Sell your car, whatever you got to do, and get, no, I'm just kidding, but we want you to get involved and, uh, and, and just do, if we all do what the Lord asks us to do, it's not going to be a problem, amen? And so uh, again, thank you so much for giving to the work of the Lord. Will you go with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 1? I won't be before you a long time. I am being respectful of the weather and of the time and trying to watch that also. But Ephesians in chapter number one uh, is where I'll take my text at today. We'll start in verse number one. I guess I don't know what I wrote down for you back there, but we'll start in verse number one and read from there. And the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you in peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he has made us accepted, amen, in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory and first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of, our, of your salvation, in whom also after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise." which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Will you back up to verse 13? And the Bible says, Ephesians 1 and 13, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I'm not near going to be able to cover what I'd like, but I want to minister to you for just a moment on this thought, being sealed by the Holy Spirit. That sounds good. Being sealed. Do you know if you're a believer, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And so let's talk about that this morning. Will you bow your head and will you help me pray today? Father, I love you today and I thank you God for your grace and for your mercy and for your love and we thank you for the opportunity to be here today, God. I'm asking in the name of Jesus Christ that you would open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive and that you would anoint my lips, God, to properly deliver your word. And I know that if I put the word forth, it cannot and will not return void. So I just pray that you would do a work that only only you're able to do, and I'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and honor in the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Now this morning, I was looking forward to preaching uh, this morning, tonight also, but uh, this morning I'm going to uh, try to slow down, do a little teaching. I want to give you something that you can take home with you uh, that would help you in your relationship with the Lord. And so I hope that you learn, I hope that you are encouraged, I hope, you know, anything that we can say that's going to give you a more of assurance about your relationship with Christ and about your name being written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, well, that's good news, amen? And so I hope that I can do that this morning. Last week, and I'll not re-preach it, but I do want to recall, last week, we looked at the two judgments of sin. Now, there are more judgments. There's a judgment of nations. There's a judgment of Israel. There are more judgments in the Bible. But we looked at the two judgments of sin. Sin is what has separated us from God. So let me tell you, whether you understand the other judgments or you look into them or if that's an interest to you to study them, the thing that you need to be concerned of more than anything else in regards to judgment is the judgment of my sin. The day that I will give an account to Jesus Christ when I am one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ and we're going to have a conversation about my life. It's not, if I'm a believer, that's not the judgment I'm talking about. That's the judgment seat of Christ. But I will give an account. But what we need to understand is, am I ready to take my judgment for sin? There are only two judgments for sin. There is judgment at the cross of Jesus Christ when we believe in what Jesus has done for us on the cross of Calvary. When we recognize and we accept the revelation that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then we move on to the next great truth that Jesus Christ has died to save us all from our sin. Once I realize I'm a sinner, then I'm ready to accept or to look for a way of salvation. And the only way of salvation is that I accept accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. That is one judgment of sin. The other judgment of sin, Revelation chapter number 20, is for those that will stand at the great white throne. Listen, you don't want to stand at the great white throne judgment. 
There's nobody that stands at the great white throne judgment that's going to hear, uh, well done, my good and faithful servant. We either take our judgment for sin now, according to what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary, or we take it later. If we take it now, it's well done. If you take it later, it's depart from me. So we already know what the judgment is going to be. When I stand before the Lord, I'm not fearing a depart from me. I, I never knew you judgment because I have placed my faith in Jesus and what he's done on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Amen. And our altar call was good. We had several that responded that came to take their judgment for sin, to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. And I want to know, I want you to know this morning, I don't want to overlook that. There were people right here at Faith Worship Center in Portia, Arkansas that came up and said, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. Listen, we ought to give the Lord a hand clap of praise for those that got saved last Sunday morning. Amen. I don't have to fear standing before the Lord because of my faith in what he has done. And listen, when we understand that and we build upon the foundation that is given to us, it will do nothing but help us to stand in the liberty, Galatians 5 and 1, that Christ has made us free. If I don't fear judgment, I get a little bit more liberty. If I know where I stand with the Lord, I get a little bit more liberty. Do you know what will happen when we start to, the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Do you know where the Spirit of the Lord is? If you're saved, He's moved in. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I have a liberty to live for the Lord. I have liberty to live for God. And so that's what our goal is, and that's what we're looking at. I want to say this, and I'll move into my text, I promise you. But I said it last week, but for a long time in my Christian walk, I pictured God as a, as a ruler of everything, and he is ruler of everything, but I pictured him as sitting high up on a throne with a big stick in his hand, waiting for an opportunity to knock me out of the kingdom. Am I alone? I pictured him as a person that was mean and angry all the time, looking for a chance to knock me out of the kingdom. That's not the picture. That's not the character that the Bible gives us at all. The Bible says God is love. God is love. You hear this morning. God is love. God is not a God waiting to knock you out. Listen, God is not a God waiting to condemn you. Of all of the things that Jesus came for, John 3, 17, he did not come to condemn you. He came to save us. God is not carrying a big stick walking around looking for an opportunity to knock you out. He is a God that is sitting there with his arms open wide waiting for us to run to him in our time of need. He's the God of love. I said he's the God of love. He's my Savior today. If I reject him, he'll be my judge tomorrow. But he's my Savior. He came to save me and to love me and to forgive me of my sins. That's what he came for. He's not looking for an opportunity to penalize. He is a God that's sticking closer to the brother, waiting for an opportunity to help us. Today, I, I pray that we help you to feel more confident in your relationship with Christ because our goal is liberty. Our goal is freedom. Our goal is to have an assurance in our heart. Jesus said, learn of me. Learn of me. Take my yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Learn of me. And so we need to learn of Jesus because his whole character is about love. I looked and I began to talk about Ephesians 1 and 13. I call Pastor Brian. I call him often, especially when I get to thinking. I call others, but I get to thinking. And I asked him, I said, have you ever heard a message on being sealed by the Holy Spirit? He said, I can't recall one. Not that we haven't, but I can't recall one. My wife said the same thing. Being sealed by the Holy Spirit. Never heard, never I have, have recorded. I, I've never preached. I've uh, been, may be 15 years. I've never preached on being sealed by the Holy Spirit. When we look at the term being sealed by the Holy Spirit, the reason that, I'll, I'll just, let me just preach to me. The reason that I left it alone is because I didn't really know what to do with the term being sealed. I didn't know what to do with being sealed. And when I uh, 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 grew up under uh, religion, grew up under not understanding grace, then all we have is we have legalism, we have works. 
And so I didn't know what to do with being sealed by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Because it sounds good. But if I preach it, then the people might think that I'm preaching once you're saved, that you're always saved no matter what you do. Okay, I'll, I guess I'll preach to me. So either we teach being sealed as a place that you can't lose your salvation. The majority of the church, they preach being sealed by the Holy Spirit as a place that you lose your salvation or we just leave it alone. And I've been guilty of that. I don't understand. I don't know. And I even tell young ministers coming up, preach what you know. If the Lord lays it upon your heart and you don't know it, study it and make sure you know it before you get behind the pulpit. So we're going to preach what we know and preach what we understand. But seal is not something that we can overlook. So we either it's either being preached as a way that there's no way you can lose your salvation or it's being left alone because it's kind of a, a, a loose term or a kind of a, a liberty term that we don't want to deal with. And so what does it mean? We know, and knowing that uh, being sealed by the Holy Spirit will help us to have an assurance in our relationship with the Lord. Listen, I don't want to, I second guess a lot of things, but I don't want to second guess my relationship with God. I, I want to know that I know. I've never opened the book, and nobody else has either, but I want to know that my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life without looking in it. And so i got to have some assurance. So I'm going to teach a little bit, preach a little bit, and I pray that being sealed by the Holy Spirit and understanding what that is helps you with your walk with the Lord. We've got to always understand that when we move from the book of Romans into the other epistles, we've got to keep in mind the book of Romans always. Romans as the foundation of the Word of God, Romans as the ABCs that's given the Christianity, we've got to understand that if they didn't understand the foundation at Ephesus or Corinth, the Apostle Paul wouldn't have been writing what he's writing. He would have went back and began teaching them the, uh, the foundation of Christ and Him crucified, the message of being baptized into Jesus Christ by our faith and faith alone. So we've got to start with the foundation. And when we look and we take into account the foundation, there's some things that we understand. We allow all the other scriptures to be built upon that foundation of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross of Calvary. Being sealed by the Holy Spirit is one of those crucial teachings that is only properly understood and taught if we understand the foundation of being, of be, of, of being baptized into Jesus Christ by our faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross of Calvary. Now, I want to take you back for just a moment. I know I'm slowing down. We are kind of froze up this morning. But I want to take you back for just a moment to foundation to Romans 4. I want to back up to Romans 4. We bounce off Romans 6 a lot. I can't leave it alone. But I want to back you up to Romans chapter number 4 for just a moment. I'm not going to apologize for foundation because, you know what? All week long, if you're like me, our flesh continues to war against our spirit and our flesh tries to resort back to works and law and what I do. That's why it's so important when we come to the house of the Lord that we have the foundation of faith presented and reinforced to us because if we're not careful with that foundation of faith and grace not being reinforced then we will. Look, I don't think we realize how easy it is to resort back to works. Why, you know why it is the first question that pops up in our mind when, we, when something's going wrong or we don't have a prayer answered? We, the first thing we do is say, well, what am I doing wrong? Because our flesh is trying to resort, resort back to works and law. So we got to have that foundation of faith and grace to being re reinforced in us continually. Romans chapter number 4, justification is given to us. So look, I know a lot of us has heard it, but there's someone here this morning that's, never, that's probably never heard it. Justification is given to us in two different parts. Justification is a legal term given over us according to our faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross of Calvary. Now watch this, two different parts. There's part number one, which is my standing. Justification and sanctification can't be separated because justification and standing or sanctification both has two parts and they're the same. First of all, watch this. Justification is my standing before the Lord the moment that I placed my faith in Jesus. It simply means this. It's the verdict over my life. 
Heaven's courtroom can only be satisfied in regards to your case and my individual case when we place our faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. It is in heaven's courtroom that you are declared guilty or not guilty for anything and everything that you have ever done. And I want you to know this morning, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. Anybody and everybody can be free and declared not guilty from anything and everything that you've ever done. So first of all, it's our verdict and it's my standing. This is my position. If I counted this floor right here as the muck and mire of sin, the moment that I placed my faith in Jesus and what he did for me on the cross of Calvary, God the Father can legally look upon my life because the moment you place your faith in Jesus, the blood covers your life. And when God the Father sees the blood over my life, he legally can say, justified. He's declared not guilty. He picks me up. That's my standing. He picks me up and he places is me. I got to fast forward. I'll come right back to it. The Romans chapter 6, I'm baptized into the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm now inside of him. Listen, it's my, it's my standing with the Lord. If you place your faith in Jesus, you're standing justified. We're standing justified. Oh, that's good. I already got more amens than that. That's good. If you're justified, you're declared not guilty. Now watch this. The second part of justification, and this is where I want to be, is it remains my position. It's my verdict, and now it's my position. I stand here. If you can imagine a circle around me, my position, I'm standing in Christ, and I'm standing as justified. Now listen, when, I, when he placed me into Christ, how many would be honest with me and tell you that after he placed me in Christ, I figured out real quick that there's still some things about me that's not yet been sanctified and holy. Amen? Some of you cursing this cold weather that's coming when I've been sanctified. This snow could be a test for you. It could be, <laughs> I'll move on. I'm standing in Christ. He placed me in Christ according to my faith in Jesus, and now I stand here in a position of remaining justified. Listen, I said remaining justified as long as my faith remains in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. Now let me bring out two different things, and I'll teach this just a little bit more. Romans chapter number 4, verses 1 through 5, tells us this. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh has found? Can I tell you this morning that Abraham found a great find? He found a great find. He found that before the law, you could be justified by faith. He found that before circumcision, you could be justified by faith. He found that without works, you could be justified by faith. He found that, he, he found that the only way that a man would be justified was by his faith in the sacrifice that God would offer. Verse number two, if Abraham were justified by works... He had where of the glory, but not before God. If works would justify him, he could, he could glory in himself. But works did not justify him. And let me just, let me just throw us all together. We got a bus. I can throw us all under the bus. If, if Abraham couldn't be justified by works, then neither could you and I. Verse number three. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness by simply believing God it was put in his account for righteousness verse number four now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace oh this gets gooder and gooder not reckoned of grace but of debt verse number five but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted to righteousness. What do I have to do in order for my righteousness to be counted into my account? I have to believe upon him. I didn't work. Listen, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm saved this morning. I didn't earn this salvation. I didn't work for this salvation. I'm not keeping a law in regards to a handwritten law and keeping my salvation. 
I got salvation because I believed on Jesus. Abraham, watch this, is a type of a believing sinner. He was a sinner that came to the Lord and he believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, I know you're quiet, but I'm assuming everybody's all right with Abraham. But let me move to David and I'll move back to our text in Ephesians. David's where we have a little problem. Verse number 6. Romans 4 and 6 says this. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. Verse 7. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. In verse 8, and we'll quit. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Watch this. Abraham is this guy. He's in sin. He believed the word of the Lord. He placed his faith in a sacrifice. And all of a sudden, the Lord took him and placed him here. And David is a type of a man who is standing as justified. And here's what David said. He said, blessed is the man whom God will not impute sin. Do you know what that word impute means? It literally means to take an inventory. As God begins to take an inventory upon a man's life that has been justified in this position, he's looking through your life. Look, God ain't going to miss nothing. You seen them people? I think it's amazing. I see them people by the, by the grocery store. I always wondered if counting out loud would mess them up because they got that little machine on their side and they're just doing this. I thought I could break them from that. They hand, them my, that, hand me that machine and let me do that for just about 10 seconds. I'd break them from that real quick. I don't know how they know what buttons they're pushing or anything else, but they're taking an inventory. But listen, they may miss something every once in a while, but God don't miss nothing. But as long as your faith is in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary, and I remain in this position, I remain in a justified position, God is taking an inventory of your life. But David says, you're blessed because God will not impute sin. He won't find sin because he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to shout because we're blessed this morning because the Lord finds no sin. Amen. That's good. Listen. David, I can't overlook it. David had an affair with Bathsheba. How does God overlook that? David said, bless. Paul used him as an example. How does God overlook that? Was David, is God overlooking adultery because of David? Absolutely not. Justification is never meant to okay sin. Justification properly taught is meant to show you the power of God's love and the power of the blood of Jesus on your life. Well, you're saying God's all right with adultery. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is if we look at the actions of David, David went extreme. David said after he had an affair, bring me Uriah. He got him drunk. He tried to trick him into going to his house the next time. Then he put him on the front line. He went to the extreme. Joshua, just put him on the front line so that he's killed and I can do whatever I can to try to cover up my affair Come on, I know this is not really popular in the religious world, but do you know why David did everything that he could? Because the moment that he got in a justified position, he got there with a person of the Holy Spirit talking in his ear continually saying, you're doing wrong. Adultery is wrong. Bathsheba is not your wife. You need to turn back to the Lord. You should not bring Uriah off of the battle. You should not get Uriah drunk. David, you're wrong. David, you're doing wrong. Do you know why that the Holy Spirit wouldn't leave David alone and all of his actions pointed as a man that was under convicted because he was in a justified position and God refused Use to let him go. Now I'm not over. Am I being plain? Because I don't want nobody to think that I'm okay in adultery. Because a person that has committed any type of sin at all, when God the Holy Spirit begins to prick your heart, you will either reject the Lord and your conscience will be seared over, or you will repent. I'm preaching good. When Nathan the prophet came and stuck his finger in the face of David, that's just the way I'm picturing it. 
He gave him the, told him the story and pointed his face. David said, who is this man that took that little lost sheep? Who is this man? I'll have him killed. And Nathan said, you're the man. It was you. He had two choices, Brother Charles. I either have his head taken off or I repent. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. He repented. What am I? I don't feel like I'm being plain. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is, the moment that you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're justified. That's the verdict over your life. You're placed inside of Christ. Now you're ready to be changed. You, you don't need to be ready to be changed if there's not anything to change. Nobody walked in here this morning perfect. Everybody in here has got things in their life that needs to be changed. And the only way that God the Holy Spirit can deal with that is to place you in a position where you can be changed. And that position where you can be changed and I can be changed is a justified position. I hadn't done a good job. He took an inventory. I'm not, I'm not okay in adultery. But I'm trying to show. See, we look at sins bigger than the other sins. Do you understand that if God would have, God loved, Tristan, he loved David too much to just hatch him out of the kingdom. He kept dealing with his heart and dealing with his life. And for the Lord to hatch us out for one reason, he'd have to hatch you out for a wrong thought that you had this morning or yesterday. Now we're responding. Because nobody want to put their thoughts up on the screen this morning. He would have to hatch us out for anything. What I come to tell you this morning is, yes, you're saved. We got a not guilty verdict upon our life. But you're not, we've not been made perfect. But thank God we're in a position that we are being changed. You see, justification is not meant to, okay, Sin, grace. Look, you don't get saved and just go back out into sin and be all right with it. You might have got saved. I'll say that. I just don't know what you got saved from. That's not the born again experience of the Bible. But if you're born again, the evidence of you being born again is that you are little by little by little being changed. We're being changed. We're being altered. We're being transformed. We're becoming witnesses unto God. And the only way that the Lord can do that is to put us in a place that we can be changed. All right? We got to move on. Now, I'm in a justified position. And now being in a justified position, Paul goes on to teach that we are sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. The first mention of being sealed is 2 Corinthians chapter number. I haven't wrote it down, but it's 2 Corinthians, whatever I give you there. Uh, we see 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 22. Who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. When he said he sealed us, this literally means that he stamped us a type of ownership. Stamped us with a type of ownership and preserved us. The word sealed means to stamp and to preserve us. That ought to make somebody happy this morning that I've been stamped an ownership, and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm owned by the Lord. Listen, I once was a servant unto sin, but now I can yield my members as instruments of righteousness because I am a servant unto God. Praise the Lord. Anybody remember the story, Hosea and Gomer? Hosea and, and Gomer. Hosea was a man that had a wife by the name of Gomer. Gomer had decided to leave his family. He left his family and went out into sin. She became a harlot. She was a harlot and found herself as a slave on an auction block. Brother Gary preached the message, love on the auction block one time. And what we saw, we see is Gomer was on an auction block when a slave would normally bring 30 pieces of silver. And when they went to bid on Gomer, nobody would bid on her. She was worthless. She was used up. She was no good for anybody. They brought her all the way down to the half price of a slave, 15 pieces of silver. And back in the back of a congregation, oh, Hosea lifted his hands up and said, I'll buy her back. Uh, she was used up and worthless, but she 
brought 15 pieces of silver and Hosea took her home and said, you are mine. You will live here and you will dwell in my house. Listen, as a sinner, we was used up. We was worthless. We was no good to nobody. But God lifted his hand and said, I'll take them and took you back home and said, you will dwell in my house. Listen, he placed us in him. We're in him. He sealed us. <laughs> he sealed us. Oh, I could go to the hedge. There's a hedge that is around about me. It says, no trespassing to the devil, and it's stamped on by God. Now, Ephesians chapter number 1. I'll get to my text. Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 3. I'll just be brief. But in verse number 3, he says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Do you know, and Jesus would said, what, good, what benefit of a man that has gained the world and lose his soul. Do you know there's people out here consumed, and I know we got to make a living, and I know that we need money. But we should not be more consumed with the things of this world than we are the things of God. He says here, spiritual blessings. When we look at spiritual blessings, do you know that that is blessings that money can't buy? It's blessings that you can't, that this world cannot give? We've had this conversation. I know I've had this conversation with my dad over and over. Dad could have, he'd have given us a ranch in Texas, but you know what? He gave us something that's more valuable than a ranch in Texas. He led us to Jesus Christ. When we look at spiritual blessings, when we're blessed with all spiritual blessings, these are things that money cannot buy, and they are beyond the riches of this world. In verse number four, he says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before God in love. It speaks indirectly of us individually, but more directly of the plan that God has for us. Do you know that God's plan for you and everybody is to be with him and to dwell with him forever? But the Lord is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He chose you for righteousness. He chose you for holiness and he chose you to be in relationship with him for eternity we've been chosen before the foundation of the world that is the plan for us and verse number five having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will listen I know there's some teaching that says some is predestinated to go to heaven some is predestinated to go to hell that's not in the Bible nowhere at all that's not that fact that's contradictory to the character of God. What he's talking about is the plan. Again, can't separate the man from the plan. God predestined his before the foundation of the world plan for you and me was to be in relationship with him. That plan was predestined. He didn't plan on anybody dying and going to a devil's hell. Never in his plan. His plan was for us to dwell with him for eternity. And verse number 6 to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. I go back to the foundation. Do you know? Think about all the issues and problems you got in your own heart that you don't want to talk to nobody else about. Did you know that Jesus has made you accepted? He made you accepted. We say it a lot, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, but through Christ, he has made me worthy for the things of God. Jesus has made you accepted. How did he make you accepted? He took you from the muck and mire and placed you here in a position covered by his blood that we are now accepted into the body of Christ. Spiritual blessings, that's what I'm talking about. He made us accepted. To be accepted, do you know what he had to do to make you accepted? He had to abolish sin. He had to abolish sin. He can't allow sin in his presence. So he got rid of sin. Verse number 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Verse number 7, jam-packed, it stands alone. First of all, we redeemed. Redeemed means to buy back. 
He had to buy us back by his blood. We owed a sin debt we couldn't pay, but he redeemed us back. How did he do it? He redeemed us by his blood. Do you know that if your faith is in Christ, you've not only been redeemed, you've been forgiven of all of your sin, past, present, and future, as long as you keep your faith in Jesus and what he's did on the cross of Calvary, we've been forgiven of all of our sin. And here's what I want you to know. The last part of verse number 7, according to the riches of his grace, this is how rich grace is. His grace is so rich that he can redeem you and forgive you of all sin. That's how rich it is. Verse number 8, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And verse number 8, grace, he has poured out to help us. What's he helping us with? Grace is there to help us with all wisdom and prudence, the the, the power, the stamina to continue on uh, for the work of God to solve all of the problems that we would would ever face in this world. He give us grace. Verses 9 and 10 we'll look at together. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Verse number 9 and number 10. The mystery that's made known unto us was that all things would be available to you and I only Through Jesus Christ. The mystery was locked up or it was kept secret while the law was here before Jesus came because the law had a purpose. And the law's purpose was to show you and I that we are a sinner and we continually fall short of what God requires from us if we try to earn it by law or works. That's what he's teaching us. And so we have fallen short of that. The mystery was was held up. Held up waiting on the fullness of times so that the law would have its purpose to reveal sin. And verse number 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And verse number 11. Listen. You have, I have an inheritance because somebody has died. That's how you get an inheritance. And that inheritance that we have is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And verse number 12, we shall receive all of these spiritual blessings if we continue to trust in Christ. We got to first trust in Christ before anything is available to us. And verse number 13, can you give me some monitor please? In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. The gospel of our salvation. In whom also after that you believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. In verse number 13. The word sealed means you've been preserved. You've been kept. As a believer I'm preserved and I'm kept. I got to bring out this word. I'll back right back up. But when he says the Holy Spirit of promise. That word promise literally means an assurance that you can count on. Holy Spirit of promise, an assurance that you can count on. I've been sealed. I've been preserved. Let me bring all this together and I'll hush this morning. I'm justified is my verdict. It's my position. But justification, I've been sealed. I've been preserved. Not to continue in sin. The verdict over my life in regards to justification is I'm not guilty. I won't be held accountable to a former sin nature. I'm not guilty. But justification is also my standing that I'm standing in the, with the Lord. And now watch this. Here's, here's the thing with religion. Here's the thing that we, that we have trouble with. Why do I still have bad thoughts and why do I still do the wrong thing if I'm born again? That's what we have trouble with. Well, the truth of the matter is, is verse number 14 would go on to say that we have a down payment. We have the earnest. We're not yet fully received everything that Jesus paid for on the cross of Calvary. 
The sin nature has been broken. The power of it is dormant. But it's not been annihilated out of our life. There would be nothing for God to change. We would go back to the day of Adam and Eve before they had a sin nature if the Lord did that. The truth of the matter is, you can place your faith in Jesus and be justified, declared not guilty, and you keep your faith there and you're placed in a position where little by little things can be changed because I have new desires. My desires are no longer for the things of the world. My desire is for the things of God. And I'm sealed. I'm preserved. I'm kept right here in this position. And here's what I want you to know. I know religion would like to ax us out. Religions would try to throw us away. The church is real good about throwing stones. We've got real good about telling people who can and who can't because we're the ones that will choose who's worthy for the grace of God. We've got real good at looking down on people because they've messed up or they've failed or their sin is different than my sin. Somebody ought to amen me there. We've got real good at looking at somebody and saying, like Brother West said a few Sundays ago, well, I'm a whole lot better than Brother Bob, and I'm a little better than so-and-so, and I'm a whole, and I, I may not be as good as Sister so-and-so, but, you know, we're rating people, and we're rating sin. I want you to know this morning, here's the truth. It's a big pill. I hope you can swallow it. You've not arrived yet. We're not perfect yet. We, if we're justified, we're in a position that we can be changed. But listen, you are not so holy that God has overlooked you and let you go by yourself. We're in a position that we can be changed and we're sealed by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And if I put these things together and back up uh, to these verses, I can tell you this. Jesus Christ did not save you to wait for an opportunity to throw you away. Jesus didn't save you and die for you to wait for an opportunity to get rid of you. He didn't offer you re redemption just so that he could wait for an opportunity to take it back. He didn't forgive you of your sins so that he could throw you away. He didn't give you grace so he could get rid of you. He didn't seal you so he could kick you out. Listen, he loved us, he forgave us, and he's not going to let go of us very easy. I'm preaching good. I want you to know this morning. I'm not overlooking sin and I'm not okay in sin. I'm not doing that. Justification does not okay sin. Justification puts us in the place that we can be changed. But listen, I'm going to say this and I'm going to hush. I want Brother Jeff to come. I want you to know this morning that throughout the week, while we're trying to live for God and we're at our job and we're mad at our boss, or we got problems at home, come on, let me just be real. We got problems at home. The first thought that we have is, God, where are you? Or what's wrong with me? Or why am I still failing if I'm redeemed and born again? These are thoughts that we have. Do you know what that is? That is nothing but the devil trying to keep you in that place of teeter totter. Because if he can get you in that place of teeter-totter, here's his end result. His end goal is to get you to quit believing that you were justified by your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. Do you know how you're saved? By faith in Christ. Do you know how you lose your salvation? You quit believing. You quit believing upon Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. We're in this position and we're being changed and here's what's happening. The Lord is trying to help you and sanctify you and the devil is trying to tell you that you're not saved and to get you to quit believing. But I come to tell you this morning, I've been and you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. I don't care what the enemy brings up, and I don't care how messed up your life is. As long as you keep your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary, God will not let you go. Amen. He won't let you go. He loves you too much to let you go this morning. Will you stand with me all across the building? Father, I love you this morning. I'm thankful, God, for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. I'm thankful this morning that I'm sealed by the power, by the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful, God, for that assurance of the promise. 
Lord, because you, you're a man that has never lied, God. You, you can't fault on your promise today. Lord, we're in the flesh, and we're in the midst of this battle, this warring that's going on in my heart. Lord, I feel your love, and God, we feel your presence. But the devil doing everything he can to tell me I'm not worthy. I'll never be able uh, to live up to holiness and that I'm not even saved. But, Lord, we also know that your word says that he is a liar. God, I'm just here this morning to tell somebody. God, though we've got problems and though we've got issues, we've been put in a place of justification wherewith we can be changed. Lord, let us believe your report and not believe the report of the devil. And let us give you, be patience, and allow you to change us and to alter us and to have that assurance in our life. I thank you, God, that we're sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Lord, by simple faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. God, we can remain in that position of being changed. I want to ask you this morning with your head bowed and your eyes still closed, I don't feel I preached it like I wanted to preach it, but I just pray that the Lord does something in somebody's heart, in somebody's life. One of the worst enemies of the church is religion. And religion tells us, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do. When the Bible in relationship says, if you'll just believe upon me, if you'll just believe, the Holy Spirit will begin to work out your own salvation little by little. He'll begin to work things out in your life. If you keep believing, God will keep, keep working. And it's all accomplished by simple faith in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. This morning, still a little unsure about my altar call. I want to do this. Before we open the altars up, and I'm going to open them up for everybody, I just want to ask you this morning, if you're here this morning, you say, I've never had that assurance of a guilty verdict, of a not guilty verdict being over my life. I don't know where I stand with the Lord. I don't know if I am declared not guilty or not. I'm not going to point you out this morning, but I want to ask you because I want to pray for you. If you're here and you say, I'm just not sure, would you slip your hand up and put it right back down real quickly? I'm not going to tarry long. Thank you, God, for that hand. Thank you, God, for that hand. Thank you, Lord, for this hand. Thank you, God, for another hand. I'm just not sure if the Lord would declare me not guilty or not. Would you slip your hand up and right back down real quickly? I'm not going to call you out. I'm just going to pray with you through the week. Anybody else real quickly? All right. Here's my other part. You're here this morning. You say, I'm in a constant battle. The devil has continued to tell me, I'm not saved. I'm not good enough. I won't be able to earn it. So much that I'm at times ready to throw my hands up and say, what's the use? What is the use? Listen, God did not intend for you to live on a teeter-totter. He didn't intend for you to go back and forth. Yes, you've got problems. The reason that you feel so bad about maybe things in your life is probably because you're saved and the Holy Spirit is convicting you. I want to ask you this morning, you say, I'm here. I've been in that limbo, and I'm tired of that limbo. Would you just slip your hand up and right back down? Thank you, God, for that hand. Thank you, Lord, for these hands. Thank you, God, for these hands. Anybody else? Your hands is a sign of faith. You ought to slip your hand up if it's for you. Anybody else? Just slip your hand up and right back down. Thank you, God. All right, here's what I want to do. I've had several hands that go up all across the building. I'm not going to point nobody out. I'm going to ask these pastors to help me to pray for people this morning. But if you slip your hand up for either to be justified or you say, I need a little help, I want you to come this morning. Find yourself a place to pray. Others ought to come also because it's a good time to pray. And let's just join together. 
Let's find ourselves a place to pray. We're going to gather around. We're going to begin to pray for you, ask the Lord to help you and to strengthen you in your walk with the Lord. Come on, you just wants to come. There's several coming already. And let's talk to the Lord this morning. God, help me to live for you. Help me, Jesus, to be what you need me to be. Come on, would you come? Come on, it's a good time to pray. Even if you didn't raise your hand, it's a good time to pray or to find somebody and pray with them this morning. We have young people up here. We have adults. We've got plenty of people to pray with this morning. Would you find yourself somebody to pray with them today? Help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus, to be assured of our relationship with you today. I stood in the courtroom. Hallelujah. Judge turned my way. It looks like you're guilty. Now what do you say? I spoke of your honor. I have no defense. Oh, but that's when mercy walked in. Oh, and mercy walked in, pleading my case, called to the stand. Oh, was God saving grace? was presented oh that covered my sin forgiven when mercy walked in I stood there and wondered just how could this be someone so guilty had just been set free my chains they were broken I felt born again oh that moment when mercy walked in Mercy walked in and pleaded my case, called to the stand. Come on, sing it with him this morning. Oh, God saving grace, the blood was presented. Come on, think about it this morning. I stood in the courtroom. We all will in heaven's courtroom. The judge turned my way. Hallelujah. Think about it. it. Looks like you're guilty. You're guilty. We're all guilty with sin. Oh, now what do, what do you, you say? say? Hallelujah. I spoke of your honor. Hallelujah. I have no, I have no defense. defense. Oh, but that's, that's when mercy Hallelujah. walked in. Come on, sing it with him today. Oh, and mercy, mercy walked, walked in. in and pleaded my case. Call to the stand. Was God saving grace. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? The blood was, the what was presented. presented. They covered that cover my sin. Forgiven when mercy walked in. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad for that this morning? 
Amen and amen. I want you to know this morning that God is a God of love. He's a God that loves you, that died for you, and he's not looking for an opportunity to throw you away. He may be looking for an opportunity to tighten the grip, but he's not looking for an opportunity to throw you away. So I encourage you, keep your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. As long as we keep believing, we're still sealed by the Holy Spirit. We don't, we're not, I'm going to say it bad in English probably, we're not unsealed unless we keep believing. And so keep believing and trusting in the Lord and what he's done for you on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Uh, we want you to be safe. Again, no service this evening because of the weather. If these men are able to come uh, to the house, uh, then we're going to do a panel at 5 o'clock on the Faith Worship Center page. Just try to encourage people. And I want to encourage you that, uh, to, if you get on there, to share it also. We have people all the time. My mom told me of somebody last night that she ran into and said, hey, we've been watching your service. And so uh, use that as an opportunity to encourage somebody or something. And so thank you so much for all that you do. And please stay tuned uh, for, for announcement in regards to the Wednesday night service. Awesome. God bless you. We love you. We hope you have a great week. And we hope to see you back here at the next time that we are able to come together. Amen. Amen. Will you bow your head this morning? Brother Seth, would you pray and dismiss the service?